There are some places where you can stand and see the big lake freighters up close. One of the best is the observation deck at the locks in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. When you observe lake boats passing close by, one thing is very noticeable. Their cargo holds are normally crowded with hatches. These openings are the place through which bulk cargoes such as iron ore, stone, and grain are loaded. Huge plates of steel weighing a half dozen tons cover the openings. Of course, the openings through which those cargoes are loaded and unloaded could not be left wide open to the seas which may come aboard. Those covers, in proper nautical terms, were called hatches. Thus, the opening itself was not the hatch. The cover was the hatch. At least that is according to Patterson's Illustrated Nautical Dictionary. On the old wooden Great Lakes freighters, the hatches were small and left plenty of deck space. In fact, the deck arrangement on steamers were often similar to those of the schooners. This allowed room for deck cargo. Additionally, the old-time unloading process involved horse-drawn buckets which were both loaded and unloaded by hand and shovel. When the process became more mechanized and the vessels became steel instead of wood, the unloading equipment required a wider space in order to reach the cargo. Thus the hatchways had to become much wider. Of course, a wider opening into the cargo hold still needed to be covered. Oddly, for many years, the answer remained basically the same as back in the wooden ship days. Big heavy wooden planks were placed across the opening. And that task was done by these guys. Each cover had to be moved by two deckhands. Once in place, they were covered with a large tarp. And that was made snug with wooden battens. This all took a lot of manual labor and a lot of time. Oddly, the removal of cargo soon became faster. But the time to close and secure the hatches took longer because there were many more hatchways to be covered. And by 1903, the size of vessels grew far larger with each passing season. In 1904, the industry turned toward a new type of hatch. These were commonly called telescope or telescoping hatches because their leaf design allowed them to expand and retract like a mariner's telescope. These were first seen on the highly innovative steamer Augustus B. Wolven, launched on April 19, 1904. Her hatchway openings were constructed on 12-foot centers. This was done because the chutes on the ore docks were spaced 12 feet apart. So the ore, in theory, could be loaded all at once from every pocket. Now such was only done on rare occasions to set records. Otherwise, it was rarely used. Still, this design itself was a time saver as far as cover and placement was concerned. That was because once the vessel was secured to the loading dock, 
There was no need to move it to reach the next chute. However, telescoping hatches still needed to be tarped and clamped down to make them water resistant. Some of these ore carriers stretched as long as 600 feet, with as many as 35 of these hatchways. They were often known as hatch farm boats. As of the making of this video in 2025, only one hatch farm boat remains in service on the lakes. This is the self-unloader Saginaw. In the early 1920s, while serving aboard the Wilson Fleet's hatch farm boat J.E. Upson, Captain Joseph Wood pondered all of those hatches. There had to be a way to make hatch movement far less laborious and far quicker and thus less costly. His concept was to have a single steel plate hatch. It would be lifted and moved by a small crane that moved on rails along the deck. Electrically powered, that crane would be operated by a single deckhand standing on a small step on one side. This innovation would allow the hatchways to be constructed on 24-foot centers, and the unused hatches could be stacked like playing cards between the open hatchways. As the fleet captain for Wilson Marine Transit Company, Wood took his idea to his employer. They had a new vessel in design, and they liked Captain Wood's concept. Thus, the new freighter, William C. Atwater, took shape at the Great Lakes Engineering Works in River Rouge. She had 18 hatch openings on 24-foot centers and a single small railroad-style rail welded the length of her spar deck on each side of those hatch combings. Additionally, each hatch had a 24-inch tall combing. This was about three to four times higher than most ore boats. Each single-piece hatch had a hole and an outward-facing notch spaced every 18 inches around its outer edge. Below on the hatch combing, were mounted swivel bolts with a corresponding wing nut. These bolts held the hatches so securely into the gasket that went around the hatch combing that no tarps were needed to keep the water out. Constructed by Northern Engineering Works of Detroit, the hatch crane was boasted as being able to move one of these five-ton hatches in just one minute. The Atwater was launched on April 4th, 1925. I wonder, as the Atwater departed on her first trips, how many Lake Mariners scoffed at her tall hatch combings, single-piece hatches, and her moving deck crane. They even came up with a nickname for her, the crane. It was referred to as the Iron Deckhand. What none of those scoffers imagined was that within a decade, those single-piece hatches and their Iron Deckhand would become the standard in Great Lakes shipbuilding. Yet the Depression of the 1930s paused most shipbuilding on the lakes. But the coming of World War II would revive it. A speculated surge in iron ore demand led to the construction of four freighters 
in the last three years of the 1930s. They were the Ralph H. Watson, the John Hulst, the Governor Miller, and the William A. Irvin. All were 600-footers, and they were all equipped with single-piece steel hatches, just like the Atwater. Under the amended Merchant Marine Act of 1939, U.S. Steel would order five huge 640-foot modern ore freighters for a 1942 delivery. They were the Leon Fraser, the Enders M. Voorhees, the A. H. Ferbert, the Benjamin F. Fairless, and the Irving S. Olds, all of which had single piece hatches. Later during the war, the U.S. Maritime Commission would order 16 new vessels, which would be dubbed the Maritime Class. All of those would have single-piece hatches. Additionally, wartime efficiency caused a number of former hatch farm boats to be converted to single-piece hatches. Following the war, Single-piece hatches would become the standard on most Great Lakes freighters constructed. The only real change would come when the 1,000-footer Stuart J. Court arrived in 1972. She had newfangled automatically opening hatches. That really didn't catch on. Because all of the other thousand footers had single piece hatches with a deck crane. It is amazing that the innovative idea of Captain Wood carried so far forward into Great Lakes maritime history. Now, as for the Atwater herself, she changed names five times in her career. In 1936, she became the E.J. Klaus. Then in 1953, she was rechristened Ben Morell. Two seasons later, she was renamed Thomas E. Millsop. In 1976, she was sold Canadian and renamed E.J. Newberry. Finally, in 1982, she was renamed Cedar Glen. So it was that on August 4th, 1984, I would catch her downbound at Mission Point in Sault Ste. Marie. When I snapped this photo of her, I had no idea that she had pioneered the single-piece hatch and hatch crane concept back in 1925. Now we saw it as commonplace. I'll bet that until this video, none of you had any idea that she held that title. She was scrapped in 1994.